Okay. So, so I don't cut into your lunch break. Let me just start, unless you want to go through lunch. So, um, so last time we talked about the CMB power spectrum, and I'll just remind you of the picture here. Let's see. Right? No. Did I just. Ah. Okay. Well, let it wake up. So I'll remind you of this picture here. And well, no, that's ahead. So that was the temperature power spectrum. And I just flashed for you, but let me go through carefully the polarization power spectrum. Um, does anybody have any questions up to this point on that? Because I, I heard there were some questions brewing. OK, so I will just say there is one question that I was asked that I thought was a great question. So maybe some people haven't thought about it, or maybe it is brewing. But um, that was a question I got about um, the phase of the oscillations and why are oscillations as they come into the horizon in phase. And the best answer I found for that is that inflation synchronizes the, fra the phases. Um, so. If that's not satisfactory, come and talk to me afterwards. If that wasn't bugging you, don't worry about it. But, um, but the fact that we see these coherent peaks that are not all washed out actually does tell us something about inflation. So imagine a whole set of phases synchronized. <clears throat> and as each scale is entering the horizon, it's coming in and starting at the same phase angle. And so all the clocks are synchronized. Okay. Anyway, okay. That's a technical detail. So let's let's talk today about CMB polarization and where I want to uh, get in. Hopefully, 15 minutes or so is explain to you these two additional power spectra. So, okay. So. So far, we've just been talking about intensity variations in the light, which is the exact same thing as temperature perturbations. Okay, they're the same thing. The CMB is also polarized, and I want to draw for you a bunch of pictures to explain why. So, when you have light that's traveling, say light is traveling in the x direction, then it can have electric, it has electric and magnetic fields oscillating in the x and y direction. Uh, sorry, in the y and the z direction. Right, so here's y and here's z. And you'll have E fields and B fields oscillating in the transverse directions. Okay? Now, let, let this line represent the direction of the E field. Okay? If this was the direction of the B field and the E field was only in this direction and this was B field, then we would actually call this light linearly polarized, that the E field is just staying in one direction, OK? If, however, there is an E field also in this direction, then we call this unpolarized light, where we have E field in both directions, both transverse directions that are equal in magnitude, OK? And so far, everything we've been talking about up until now has been unpolarized light. So, fo so far, been talking about unpolarized light. Unpolarized. OK. Now, when light is polarized, so I said either you just have an E field in one direction, so this is 
unpolarized. But if it's polarized, you can either imagine only an E-field in one direction, like this, or an equal E-field. So here's Y and here's Z. Say I have uh, an E-field of a much um, smaller magnitude in the other direction. So say in my Y direction, the E-field, the strength is very big, but in the other direction, it's much weaker. So unequal E-fields cause polarization, okay? The strength of the E field is what we call the intensity of the radiation. Okay, so let me write that down. So, intensity of radiation of radiation equals strength of E field. Okay. All right. So, so when it's unpolarized, we say the intensity is equal in both directions. Okay. How do we get polarized light? So one way to get polarized light is if we have Compton scattering. It's a natural mechanism to make light polarized. So. So what happens is, let me draw my picture again. Let me make this Z, Y, and X. And say I have my electron sitting here at the origin, OK? So now I've got my light that's unpolarized. So OK, so, so when we draw these polarization directions, we draw them as headless vectors. So no arrows, actually. And the, the size of the line tells you the magnitude of the E field, and the direction tells you the direction of the E field, which is, we call it, um, OK, so it's the direction of the E field. So now I've got my unpolarized light coming in. And what happens when it scatters off the electron the E field that, say it want, it's going to scatter and go out in the Z direction, the E field that's parallel to the Z direction, that intensity doesn't get through. Okay, so the only intensity that gets through is, is perpendicular to the d outgoing direction. So it comes in here, it goes out this way, and you naturally get polarized light. Okay? It's not an odd concept. We have unpolarized light from the sun, when it scatters off water, it becomes polarized in the horizontal direction. That's why you wear polarized glasses that don't allow light coming in the horizontal direction, only allow light coming in the vertical direction. That's why you reduce your glare when you go water skiing, etc. And that's why your sunglasses aren't as effective unless you're near water, right? Great. Okay, you learn about microwaves and your sunglasses here. Okay, so... Yeah. <laughs> so look, <laughs> yeah, so light, so water polarizes light. Okay, so you would think that Compton scattering would be on its own great. Like, you know, any unpolarized light that hits the electron becomes polarized. But light comes in and scatters off the electron in all directions. Light comes from all directions. So here's my y, my x, and my z. I can have unpolarized light coming like this and allowing only this to get through. But then here I will have 
light polarized like this, and it lets this component through. That's in the same direction as the X. So my net result is actually unpolarized light. So if I was just having Compton scattering from all directions, I would still get unpolarized light. Okay. So what would you think that I would need to get polarized light if this picture doesn't work? So we said E field is the same as intensity, right? The strength of my E field is my intensity. So what do I need my photons to have of? In right, so, so right, I would need some anisotropy in my intensity field, okay? But what kind of anisotropy? Okay, so she's saying quadrupole, so let, let's discuss why. So, the most simple thing you could imagine is dipole anisotropy, right? So say, say have dipole anisotropy. Right, then I draw my C, Y, X. Now, if I have a dipole, then, so here's my, my plus X and my minus X. And if I have a dipole, imagine this is hotter and this is colder. So I'll have, say, a hot spot here on this side and a cold spot. Okay? Just remember, like, like the temperature fluctuations we were looking at before. Minus x. So now, if it's a hot spot here, all the intensity of my own polarized light is higher than average. Okay? So say average is just like me making one straight line. This intensity is all higher, higher than average, okay? And then here, my intensity is lower than average. Let me make kind of like a very thin sort of dotted line, okay? So that's lower than average over there. But what's the problem? They're going to cancel each other because th when this scatters off the electron, whoops, I've dropped all my electrons here, then this will let out, this will let through light going like this, and this will as well, but they're going to add together and give me my same line back again, right? In the y direction, I just had something regularly polarized. No hot and cold spot, it's average. And that's also going to give me average. So I'm going to again end up with unpolarized light. Okay. So, over here. So, what's going to give me polarized light is a quadrupole. So, get polarized. light from quadrupole anisotropy that is occurring at the time of photon decoupling, okay? At the time of photon decoupling. So I'm going to make my picture and I'm going to get Z X, Y, this is going to be more intense than average. Here is going to be less intense than average, okay? And when this guy goes through, I get something that's intense, more intense than average. And when this guy goes through, I get something less intense than average, okay? And that's going to give me polarized light. Okay. 
else. Now, yeah. So, in the quarter report, am I right to say that there is hot, cold region? Yeah. And then here, hot and cold is going in the y direction. Yeah. It seems like I'm getting average along x and along the y. Am I getting regular x and y uh, lag? No, but here is going to be hot, cold. Here is also going to be hot. And then uh, minus y is going to be cold. Okay. Okay. So that's the quadrupolar and isotropy. Okay? So it's unpolarized light. Oh, polarized light. Okay, great. But what we said last time is we were in, we were in the coupled regime, right? During photon decoupling. We were in... We were in tightly coupled regime. And that meant we said that only the monopole and the dipole were significant, right? But, but there is a small quadrupole. And because it's small, what you can expect is the polarization is going to be a much weaker signal than the primary intensity fluctuations, right? So, a small signal. So, to give you a sense, the polarization fluctuations are one part in 10 to the 5. So, sorry, the temp. So the delta T over T is one part in 10 to the minus 5. Uh, the polarization signal, do I do average polarization? The amplitude of the polarization signal is about 10 to the minus 7. So about two orders of magnitude smaller, OK, the fluctuations. I'll say delta T is 10 to the minus 5, and delta P is two orders of magnitude smaller, okay? Okay, great. So, and as I said, when you see maps of the C and V in polarization, you'll see a bunch of headless vectors, you know, in various places, where this is telling you, the length is telling you the magnitude of the E field and the orientation is telling you the axis along which the intensity is greatest. Should I write that down or is that, let, let me write that down. So headless vector length equals magnitude. And the line for you just had the same intensity in the x and y direction for polarized light as our t. And now I can have um, some amount, um, adding to the temperature in the x direction and, and adding in the x direction and taking away in the y direction. Right now, if I have my E field stronger in one direction as opposed to the other. And then I can also have 45 degree orientations, not just x and y, but in 45 degrees. Y. That's y polarized light. Y polarized light. Good. OK. Now. Four density perturbations. So why I'm saying that if your quadrupole is due ultimately to density perturbations, which are scalars, right? So for density perturbations, which we call scalars, then we can write Q theta equals P theta cosine 2 phi and u theta equals p theta sine 2 phi. You, something else that will cause um, 
Anisotropies in this way are gravity waves, which would be tensor perturbations. Then this doesn't hold. Okay, this holds for density perturbations. Here, theta equals the like the position on the sky. Theta is position on sky. So imagine it's just the coordinate of my pixel. And phi is orientation. Let me move this up a little bit. Orientation. of polarization vector with respect to the x-axis. For example, you pick an axis with respect to x-axis. Okay. So because I can write it like this, I can take a linear combination of these. Oh, okay, well first, let me back up one step. I can Fourier transform these. So I could say now that I have Q of L equals P of L cosine 2 phi L and U of L where L is conjugate to theta. Okay, so I can just Fourier transform, and now I'm talking about my Fourier space Q. Yeah. Um, P would be like in my, if I had like my Q and U space. Well, the, um, I mean, this is basically giving me my definition of P, right? This, this is, I've defined Q and U for you. Now use that as definition of P, okay? It's like, it's like the magnitude. If all my polarization was in the Q direction and along the x-axis, then it's like specifying the magnitude of the Q, right? It's just, right, vector. Okay, so now I can take a linear combination. And we say that E of L in Fourier space is QL cosine 2 phi L plus UL sine 2 phi L, okay? And B of L is minus Q of L sine 2 phi L plus U L cosine 2 phi L. So what can you tell me about B of L over here, given my definitions of Q, L, and U L? Um, I'm just telling you. I'm just to skip ahead. Okay. You know, I'm saying I can write this, and it only holds for density perturbation. And then there's some math to explain. Why. But given that, what do you see for B of L? It's always zero. Okay. So if I stick in this Q of L and I get my cosine and then I stick in my U of L, then uh, BL equals zero for density perturbations. And we call this, we call this now E mode polarization, and we give this the name as B mode pole. Okay? So, all those experiments searching for B modes, you know what they're looking for now, and you know why, 
because if they see anything that's not zero, it means it's coming from gravity waves, primordial gravity waves. Or lensing, which is a technical thing, because gravitational lensing also can convert E modes into B modes. <coughs> but the scales are not the same. Primordial gravity waves are usually on large scales, and the lensing is more on, on um, small scales. But there is a mix of the two, and you have to be careful about it. OK. So, okay, so, you know, non zero B modes at large scales would technically will indicate uh, gravity waves, primordial gravity waves, and since inflation naturally produces those, um, some say, then that would could be a smoking gun for inflation. Okay, and the E mode, if you just see the pattern in real space. just for completeness. If E is greater than zero, you'll see something that looks like this, where all the vectors are in the outward direction. If you, if you look at your map, and you look at the direction of, the, of these polarization vectors in your map, and if it's less than zero, you'll see something like this, OK? And B modes in real space, in map space, will look like, I'm getting slightly better at drawing this. Let's see, here, 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 and then, OK, like that. And then, so they'll look like these curly things. OK, here, here. Here, 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 like that. So there'll be these like spiral patterns. Back, yeah, space. yeah. Okay. This is real space, and that's why they have this name of E modes and B modes. Okay, okay, great. So I now told you what E L is. So this on the bottom here is just the power spectrum of E L, right? So I'm just squaring it. OK, so that's my EE power spectrum. And then what's at the top is the cross spectrum. I can make a map of my temperature fluctuations, and I can make a map of my E mode fluctuations, and I can take the cross power. That's TE, OK? Why not take the cross power? There's information in it. So density perturbations will give you the TT, TE, and EE fluctuations a power. And I think the previous one then we said TT. Yep. TE is, I can take any two maps. What an auto spectrum is, is taking two maps and taking their cross power. That's called an auto spectrum. So I take a T map and I take a T map and I take their auto spectrum and that gives me CLTT. All I'm doing is interchanging one map with E. So I take my E map, and I take my T map, and I take a cross power. And that gives me CLTE. No reason I can't take a cross power. I can do auto spectrum. So auto CLEE -E is just E and E. And I can just interchange the map and take a cross power. OK? Is the temperature at different places and multiplying together, or temperature and multiplying by NFIE? You Fourier transform mm -hmm. each map. And then you are basically doing, in Fourier space, you're multiplying L modes together and averaging in Fourier space. OK? OK. And great. why is that better than just doing temperature by itself? Better, right? More information. Because the E mode power spectrum is, is, is totally independent uh, constraints on parameters. It's as if, you know, I, we talked about cosmic variance, and I only have one universe, but it's if I have a whole new window to look at the fluctuations, right? So, so say I just have some random fluctuation in temperature due to cosmic variance. There's no reason I should have that same random fluctuation in, in the polarization, right? Right, yeah. So, yeah, okay, good. So there's a lot more information. Um, so one more question. Uh -huh. uh, in these plots, uh, those, is that a fit, or is that the prediction, the red line? Um, this is the best fit. So this is what I'm going to talk right now is 
a fit of six parameters. And it fits through all this. If all of this, it fits through the TT, the TE, and the EE. And the other reason why you want T temperature and polarization is that if I just had the one temperature curve and I have six parameters, I've got some degeneracies. Polarization would break the degeneracies. Okay? So, um, so polarization is very powerful, but as I said, the caveat is it's a super small signal. And so it's been difficult to measure. WMAP only had, uh, you know, it had polarization on, on some large scales, but its error bars and polarization were sizable. And one of the main additions of Planck is the additional shrinkage of the error bars on the polarization spectra. That's one of the main things Planck added. Okay. So let's look at the parameter constraints now. No, they're the same L's. The x-axis, I believe, is the same. These are not the same. And in fact, there are some, there are some factors that this is DL and this is CL. It means this is the power spectrum CL that we're talking about. This is multiplied by an additional LL plus 1 times CL factor. And they do that just so you can see the, the peaks nicely. So that's DL. OK, so now, when you vary the parameters of the universe, so varying, let's see how I'm, OK. When you vary omega, omega m h squared, and it's well, OK. Um, say curvature, dark energy, these alter the power spectrum. I'll call them power spectra now, because you know you have at least three of them here. And um, so you want to measure the power spectrum as accurately as possible to constrain these parameters. Okay? So let's give an example of how varying something changes the power spectra. So let's talk about, so the baryon density has two main imprints on the CMB power spectrum. So let's look at the CMB TT power spectrum for now. So one thing that we talked about is if you add more baryons to your photon baryon fluid, the baryons, they're pressureless. So you add more baryons to photon baryon fluid, you actually reduce the sound speed, OK? Um, so, this, so the sound can't propagate as fast. So baryons decrease sound speed. And that means that it also reduces the size of the sound horizon at recombination. OK? So reduces size of sound horizon. At decoupling. At, at decoupling. So the way to think about, so what, what's happening? I have a physical scale. Let's call it R sound horizon. And then it's going to correspond to some angular diameter distance at the time of decoupling. So that's going to be my 1100 times my theta, which is some angular scale. OK? We said the CMB is a standard ruler. This is this I know from physics. This is my sound horizon. So this is known. Q 
here is where my cosmological parameters enter. So I can, I can have some params in here. Um, I, I'm just I'm doing this a little bit hand wavy just to ex just explain you what's happening when you add baryons. And here is what I measure. Okay, so I'm just talking about okay. So I can measure a scale, and say the first peak I measure at one degree. Okay. If I change the physical scale, make this smaller, then the main effect I'm going to have is it's going to shift all my peaks to, to smaller scales, OK? So this is going to shift the acoustic peaks to higher L. And remember, theta is 1 over L, roughly, OK? So small theta is over here, high L is over here, OK? So I add more baryons, and it's going to shift my whole power spectra to higher L. Yeah? No, no, I'm just giving you one example, fixing everything else. And right, 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 I will we'll talk all about degeneracies in a second. OK, so I'm just giving you one example of what happens here. Let me move this up, bring this down. Um, but, but when we discuss it, Hubble is usually a derived parameter. It's not one of the six we vary in lambda CDM, usually. usually. So I will get to that. You can, but then it's interchangeable with the scale of the first peak. Oh, right, right. Here I'm just varying omega b. I'm just telling you what I what happens when I vary omega b. Okay. The other thing that happens when I vary omega b. So I'm just trying to give you a sense of what's happening. Is that bary? So I have my like wells of dark matter, and I have my photon baryon fluid. And here's my dark matter. If I had more baryons in that fluid, they're going to want to be even more strongly attracted to my dark matter potential well. And when the photons want to push the fluid out, they're going to have a harder time, right? So baryons are attracted to potential wells. And I'm going to have that my compressions are larger than the rarefactions. Because during the rarefactions, the photons are going to you know, have a harder time. But the baryons are only too happy to go into the wells. Now, remember, the odd peaks are associated with compressions. So that means the odd peaks, which are the compressions, enhanced with respect to the even peaks. With respect to even peaks, which are the rarefactions. Rarefractions. OK. But now, if we, so let's go to our temperature power spectrum again. If we really want to understand a little bit more, and let's focus in on understanding the third peak with respect to the second peak, it's not just the omega b that's important, but it's actually the baryon fraction, omega b to omega m. So for understanding ratio of Omega M is actually dark matter plus baryons. For understanding ratio of second to third peak, baryon fraction is most important.
because it's not just omega b. If I dial this up, um, well, let me write it here. So our baryon fraction is omega b over omega m h squared. If this is small, then basically my baryons are going to be very heavily influenced by my dark matter potential, right? This is going to be giant, and this is going to be small, and my baryons are really going to be pulled by the dark matter potential. So if the fraction is small, baryons will feel a strong pullback. If no dark matter, so let's look in the extreme case. If you have no dark matter, then the compressions and the rarefactions will be equal. There's no reason for them not to be equal, right? So, so no enhancement of third peak of third peak relative to second. Can I keep putting this board up? Is that okay? I'm just continue right over here. Okay. Okay. So so what's gonna happen if you don't have any dark matter, you know, all your compression should be the same as the rarefactions, but then you're still gonna have diffusion damping. So, so in that case here, peaks will follow normal fall off. Normal diffusion damping fall off. So I would see my CLTT versus L, and I would see a first peak, second peak, third peak, fourth peak. So they're all the same, and then I add the diffusion damping fall off, okay? All right. So here's an animation where, so let me write down what's in this animation. animation. So I have here omega h b fixed, h not fixed. I'm assuming the universe is flat. And I am I'm increasing. So I'm omega h squared decreasing in this animation. So I'm going to keep dialing down the dark matter, basically. And then omega lambda varies to keep flatness. So that's what's happening in this animation, okay? That I stole from Wayne Hughes, Wayne Hughes page. So let's see. So here, I'm just dialing down the dark matter, okay? So the first thing you can see, which isn't what we're going to, you know, focusing on, is actually when you dial down the dark matter, the first peak actually goes up. That's a, that's a different issue, um, and let's not focus on that right now. Let's focus on the second and third peak. So when it starts out with our lambda CDM parameters, when you have dark matter and baryons, and you find the second and third peaks have the same height relative. And then as you basically remove all the non-baryonic dark matter, you see the second peak gets greatly enhanced with respect to the third peak, okay? So, so first, uh, L and L. Okay. this thing, this is an ISW effect happening here. And that, 
this is called an integrated Sachs-Wolf effect here that's happening, and that's also responsible for why you have the first peak increase. But let's not focus on that. So that's why I say the ratio of the first and second peaks is actually, the, in my opinion, the strongest evidence for non-baryonic dark matter, largely also because you're in completely linear regime with well-understood physics, whereas rotation curves, maybe bullet cluster, I mean, those are all very strong pieces of evidence, but you have nonlinear physics. Um, you know, then people say they can invoke MON. Nobody has used MON to explain this third peak. Okay. What else can I say about this? Oh, so when I was a grad student, we had basically had from WMAP data the first peak and a little of the second peak. So that's why I was all like, what's the third peak going to be, et cetera. You know, that was excitement back then. And then the third peak came out to be this. Yeah. <coughs> Just uh, are, are these things the dark matter self interaction? Is this the um, if you're going to ask about uh, worm dark matter, for example, there'll be a cutoff in the matter power spectrum at some scale. And then we showed how the CMB power spectrum is related to the matter power spectrum. Um, but I don't think you could see it on, a, on any of these scales. The, the warm dark matter cutoff, if you wanted to see it, you would have to probe like 10,000, like L of 10,000. Um, so I think, and, and you know, unfortunately, because I've looked into these issues, but uh, for the E mode power spectrum, you should usually go about to L of 5,000. Some people say, um, L of 20,000 is not necessarily ruled out for the E-mode power spectrum. The reason why you can't do it with temperature is you've got foregrounds. You've got other foregrounds at small scales, like galaxies, that emit temperature microwaves, but they're not polarized. Or if they do have any polarization, it averages down. So now people are just starting to get observations of the high L EE power spectrum and are seeing that the foregrounds look a lot uh, better than they thought a lot lower than they thought initially. So we might be able to get out to L of 20,000, maybe, 10,000, maybe 20. But I think uh, if you're thinking about, say, like what halos shouldn't form in a given warm dark matter model, unfortunately, you need to go out farther than that. Um, yeah, to talk, yeah, so unfortunately, because you're, you're really talking about halos like 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 10 solar masses. There's no like robust bounds, or maybe there are that uh, that say that you can't have interactions of this cross section with dark matter because of the CMB. Oh, oh, you okay? Now we're talking about self. You mean like self, self annihilation? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so um, yes, and so I thought you meant annihilation uh, with no output of standard model particles. That's what I meant. Yeah, dark matter, dark matter scattering. Right, so for that, the, for that, with no output of, of standard model particles, and if it's going to look like just some warm dark matter type of thing, um, or even like some axion model that, that's, you know, cutting off some scale, that you would only see in, in a matter power spectrum at small scales, and so you need a high LCMB. If you're talking, right? So people have been looking at Lyman Alpha, and that's had the tightest constraints. Um, actually, what people are trying to do now is probe substructure with lensing. So looking galaxies and probe substructure. Now if you're asking a separate question, which is um, as a function of dark matter mass, and now if I have dark matter, so now we're going on a tangent, but if I have dark matter going into some standard model particles, that dump energy into the CMB, that I can constrain, right? Any, anything that's going to dump energy into the CMB, I can constrain very well, right? It's just another parameter that I vary over. So now people generally use this P annihilation parameter, which is you have some efficiency factor and a cross section of your annihilation and then the mass of your dark matter particles. So I, I have a degeneracy here. I'm going to tell you. The efficiency of how 
the standard model particles dumped energy into my CMB, like with what efficiency it was absorbed, which might not be 100%, the cross-section of my annihilation and my dark matter particle. And then for this, um, then I get a plot of cross-section versus mass, and my constraint usually looks like this, with all this ruled out from the CMB, plus low redshift probes, which is usually BAO, which I will hopefully get to in a minute. And then usually uh, around here is a thermal cross-section, 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second. That's the cross-section you expect to explain the amount of dark matter we see today, if this model is correct, right? And then usually somewhere here is like a GEV, and that's why if you're going below that to like MEV, sorry, right, MEV dark matter, you have to do some gymnastics to evade the CMB bounds. And you can talk more about that after coffee, like coffee or whatever. Okay, Cur let me give you an example of what curvature does. So. Okay, so again, we said here we have a sound horizon, a DA at our redshift, and theta. What adding an omega lambda or an omega k term does is it changes this, the angular diameter distance. And that, and this stays fixed, fixed. It's not changing the sound speed. So what's changing is my angle, and it's just going to be a straight shift across. So again, stealing from Wayne Hugh, if I vary my curvature um, or my dark energy and, it, and everything else is fixed, then it, I'm just shifting the peaks, right? This is why I had said previously that curvature, in large part, is coming from the position of that first peak. Fixing other things, fixing other. So let me actually, I'm going to discuss it in much in more detail uh, in one second. So let me tell you what the Planck parameter results were. Do I end, do I, is it literally 20 minutes? Okay. I may take some Chaba liberties. We'll see. Okay, so what were the parameters? Um, so let me. Shut this up so that you will not stop looking at it. <laughs> okay, so Planck 2015 parameters. Okay, so, th so this was from their paper 13, which is a parameters paper. So Planck, their data came out in two bunches. One was in 2013, then they had basically the final release in 2015. So this is their parameters paper, paper 13. So if I take Planck TT, TE, EE, and there is some question about their high L polarization and how reliable it is, et cetera, but that's a detail. Then they've got some parameters where I can just give you a sense of error bars. 0016, for example. So we've got six lambda CDM parameters. Baryons, cold dark matter. This parameter, we'll define them in a second. NS. Six lambda CDM parameters. You, you should feel um, somewhat impressed that only six parameters exactly go through all of those data points that we have, given all the tiny errors. So okay, so this is cold dark matter. And then this, which is one.
This is the angular scale of my so sound horizon. So roughly. Right? So that's telling me the position of my first peak. Now tau, there's been a lot of issue over tau. When the WMAP results came out, tau was very high. Tau is telling me it's that optical depth parameter that we discussed before. But what it's actually telling me is when did reionization happen? When did the first stars start to form? And when the WMAP1 results came out, one of the most surprising things they had was a very large tau value. Um, I forget exactly the number, maybe 0.17. And that meant that stars had to form way earlier than anybody's stellar models could make happen. This is the tau, tau from that paper. Just a few months ago, there was a revisit of tau, and it's actually come down even more to 0.05 now. But let me just use the numbers from this paper. Then these parameters, and ns, are my inflation parameters. 0 0.9645. I'm just giving you a sense of error bars. So this is telling me that my initial power spectrum, so we talked about the matter power spectrum. It's just the RMS of my dark matter perturbations. But this is telling me what was laid down initially at the time of inflation. And we usually characterize the initial power spectrum like this, with an amplitude and a power law. Why not? We don't know what else it's supposed to be. Why not just say it's a power law spectrum, right? And inflation would predict NS is close to 1 because there's no reason to have a preferred scale. Okay? But inflation actually predicts NS to not be exactly 1. And that's actually also what we measure. So it's not supposed to be exactly 1. Okay. Now, these are the six parameters we vary. Then what you'll see when you look at any Planck paper is you'll see derived parameters. Those are H naught, sigma 8, and omega matter. Okay? If I know these parameters, I derive these. I just, I just run my basic linear theory forward in time, and I can tell you how much matter should cluster today, what H naught should be, what omega matter today is, um, assuming GR is correct. Okay? So those are the derived parameters. This is assuming that you have an initial power spectrum to whatever mechanism, if you're objecting to me saying inflation, fine. I'm just saying whatever is the initial power spectrum, this constrains the parameters of that. Yeah. Those three derived parameters are parameters for today. And these are parameters for uh, no, when people talk about these, quoting these values, they are quoting today. Everything is today. Today, today. This is the scale at recombination. This is an optical depth integrated over the whole universe, and then these are the initial fluctuations. Then my question might be, everything happened in large yeah. gathering, and then we need to have a way to evolve in today. Standard then linear then theory. No, 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 no. That's why CMB is so powerful. You okay. always stay in the linear regime. Yeah. There's no reason, there's no reason I need to go into a nonlinear regime. My CMB is all linear, right. right? And then I use those parameters, and then I can just tell you how, given those parameters, I know how my universe has expanded on large scales, and I can tell you how the density of those parameters drop. I never need to go into a nonlinear regime. That's why the CMB is so powerful. On linear scales, sigma 8 is just large enough that it's telling you the clustering on 10 megaparsec scales. And the matter that fell into the 10 megaparsec scales always stayed on linear scales. They always could be described by linear perturbation theory. 
And what sigma-8 is actually doing is telling you the amplitude of the matter power spectrum. That's literally what it's telling you. So never, never nonlinear scales here. Okay, so extensions to this model. To lambda CDM, what you'll see is let me get to okay. So you'll see things like curvature not being zero, um, neutrino mass not being not the minimal neutrino mass. So we know it has to be at least this from oscillation experiments. You'll see varying of n effective not being 3.046 which is the standard model. So now when I say extensions, I mean the lambda CDM model assumed, assumed omega k equals zero. It assumed neutrino mass is 0.06 eV. It assumed n effective is this. So now I'm saying if I now free up all of these parameters, so it assumed the helium was 0.24667 it assumed no scale um, no scale dependence of ns and it assumed tensors are zero and w was minus one this was all assumed in the lambda cdm model and that's, this is an important one because people forget they're fixing flatness when they do that. Varying any of these is called an extension to lambda CDM. And if you varied all of them, then you wouldn't be able to constrain anything anymore. So it's usually people vary combinations of them. So let me... No, they get an effective by freeing the parameter up. But I'm saying in the lambda CDM six parameter model, an effective is fixed to this. Then they free it up and look at what the constraint is. Yeah. Yes. You don't see omega M as a drive? Oh, right. That's derived too. By assuming flatness. I mean, it, naturally, if I assume flatness, and I've measured omega baryon and cold dark matter, then I, I know how to make them. They're great, right. OK. OK, what else can I say? Well, this one I can't put up. Maybe I did this in the wrong way. OK, let me, and this I can't put up either. Do we all need to see the numbers again, or we can go to the Planck paper? And let me, did you, OK, let me put this down. OK, so. Sigma 8 is. Imagine, here's my way of explaining it. Imagine I take an ice cream scoop and I scoop out a chunk of the universe today. And then I look at the dark matter fluctuations in that ice cream scoop and I calculate the RMS fluctuations, that's sigma 8. Sigma 8 is telling me the RMS fluctuations in my ice cream scoop that is 10 megaparsec sphere. And why is it sigma 8? No, because. It was always, I forget now which way it goes. It was 8H inverse megaparsecs, which was 10 megaparsecs, or something like that. So because of the H and how they defined it, then it became sigma 8. OK, let's look at one extension. So let's free curvature. And that, that goes, this now goes to the question you were asking originally in lecture one. So I have mega lambda here, and I have a mega matter. And if I was flat, if I had a flat universe, that would look like this, where this is 0, this is 1, 0, 1. And I would live somewhere on the line if the universe was flat, OK? Remember today, the amount in baryons today and the amount in radiation today is insignificant. So I love, live somewhere on the line. C and B alone 
would give us something, uh, my drawing, that kind of looks like originally when the W map data was out, it was like it was like something like this contour, okay? It was a region like that. It was close to flat, but it wasn't right on the line, okay? So from the C and B power. And I could have, at least with the W map time, I could have omega being one. All, everything in omega matter, okay? And, and omega lambda equals to zero. Because at the C and B time, well, it kind of actually could have gone here. Remember, I'm making one and two sigma contours, okay? Then, if you added the H naught data, which we already had by then, the Hubble Key Project, this was, WMAP was 2003, Hubble Key Project was 2001. So we already had Wendy Freeman making an awesome measurement of H naught in 2001. And if you added that, that forced you to live here, okay? Because for this, I said H naught to derive parameter, right? So I can calculate what's the predicted H naught. And if I now put a prior from H naught, then I would be fixed to flatness. So if added, then forced omega k equals zero and that you had to have dark energy. Okay, so that was the state for a while while I was a grad student. Now what we have is something else which is called CMB lensing. So CMB power plus CMB lensing, lensing forces the same thing. And what CMB lensing is, is you have the background CMB, primordial CMB, right? And here I am collecting all the data, and then I have all this dark matter everywhere. And the gravity, gravity is going to bend and deflect the lights, and I'm, of course, exaggerating everything, but my light's all going to get bent. So any time I had, um, so any point where I observed the temperature, was actually going to come to me from an unlens point of n plus some delta phi, where this is the deflection angle. And that's related to my potential. It's a very subtle effect, which is why we've only measured it actually for the first time in 2011 uh, with the ACT collaboration of 4 sigma, then with SPT at 6 sigma. Um, by my former postdoc, and then now with Planck at 40 sigma, I think we, maybe we're up at 50 sigma now adding polarization. This little subtle effect couples those L modes together in a very special way that I, I remember I told you initially they were all independent. The L modes in the CMB temperature field are all independent here, but lensing couples them in a very specific way. I can extract that coupling and I can actually make a map of the projected dark matter between me and the CMB. And then I can take that dark matter map and constrain more physics with it, in particular the neutrino mass, which hopefully I'll say a second a word about. And lensing also deflects the polarization of the CMB. So I can measure lensing in temperature and I can measure lensing in polarization independently. So now the big take home message you should get from this is evidence of dark energy from CMB alone. So don't anybody tell you some story about how I don't believe supernova and I don't like the H naught measurement and blah, 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 blah. You say to them, I don't care. The CMB is clean, and the CMB has evidence for dark energy alone. No, no more added H0. So no. So I'm uh, sorry, I didn't make that clear. Now, don't need H0. <laughs> you don't need 
anything else but the CMB to get evidence for dark energy. Yes. I don't care. Right. Sure. Yeah. Oh, great. Great. So perfect segue. So tensions. So I'm, I'm not going to say what BAO is. I'll leave that for Scott Todelson. But instead of adding lensing, I could have added BAO as well. So I don't want to explain that. So I can just show, let me just show you this plot and then talk about the tensions. So here's the plot that I just meant. Here is C and B power spectrum alone, even adding TT and EE. The reason why the contours are not going all the way down to um, one here is because actually there is a little lensing signal in even that power spectrum that now Planck measures. Here is H0. So you can see now when I fixed H0 to 70, I tighten things. But now I don't care. Now I can add lensing and I get these blue contours, the blue one and two sigma contours. And if I even added BAO on top of that, BAO is, is basically measuring that first peak at different redshifts. It's measuring the CMB first peak at different redshifts. That's why it's called baryon acoustic oscillation. Same thing. And, but it's just an independent measurement. And that tightens me up even more. OK, so now what are the tensions in the data? Oh, and, and here you can be impressed with all these all my extensions to lambda CDM here. You can't read them, but it's OK. This is R. This is running helium and effective neutrino mass curvature. Yeah. Yes, I am. That's exactly what I'm saying. You can throw them out if you don't believe them, if you have issues with the fact that maybe there's some dependence of brightness on the size of the host galaxy, or you're not satisfied with how they use extinction corrections locally and apply them to high redshifts. I'm just saying I don't, you don't need to care. Right? Well, they're just saying, let me assume everything is correct, and then let me see what's the tightest error bar I can get. But I'm just telling you in a more big picture sense, C and B is, in my opinion, providing the strongest evidence for dark matter and dark energy. And you don't need to, you know, if you're a skeptic on anything else, or, or the best way to say this is if you encounter, you know, some crackpot at a workshop, which I, you know, just did, and there are other, you know, postdocs, then they start telling you that they don't believe supernova and this and that. The answer is C and B alone gives you evidence for dark energy. Done. Move on. Okay. So that that's that literally just happened a week ago at a workshop we had. And that was how a great postdoc just shut down the conversation. OK, so outstanding tensions. Say that again? Oh, push this middle word up a bit. OK, great. So just the last word on the tensions, H0. What's going on? So the CMB plus TT, TE, EE and lensing and CMB lensing. So I took the number just CMB only is 67.51 plus or minus 0 0.64 second megaparsec. Adam Reese just had a paper out using Cephes and supernova, and I think there's water maser measurement in here, and he's getting 73, 1.75, which he's saying is a 2.5% measurement of H0. Now, these folks like to say, well, this is a local direct measurement. Um, so, and this is an extrapolation from the time of photon decoupling to today. So they like to say, well, trust this one more. George Estafiu, who had papers, at least a paper analyzing this data, said 
Well, he disagrees. Let's not go into the details. Also, if I took out lensing and added BAO, I get the same low number. This number from Planck is consistent with the W map numbers that came before. Those numbers were like 69. So within error bars, they were all consistent. So either there's a problem here. Well, OK, look. And this is, this is not heavily reliant on the polarization data. So even though one could argue that there's issues with the polarization data, it's not heavily reliant on that. Are there issues here? Well, OK, if we take it all at face value, and we, you know, we want to be ambulance chasing particle physicists. I love particle physicists, but I know particle <laughs> physicists. <laughs> um, you could either say that this is pointing to an effective as, as not 3.04, although someone did point out to me that there's a recent paper done by you know group of people that I do think know what they're doing, and they were saying that this is actually. Um, more compatible with W being less than minus 1. So um, extending the lambda CDM model to this. So let me put question marks here. So I mean, this, this whole game is, do you know your systematics? Do you trust your measurement? Yeah. And effective is the number of relativistic species, not, not talking about photons, so number of relativistic species. And it's basically three for our three neutrinos that were relativistic at the time. And then there's this little 0.046 addition that comes in just through normal, like standard model theory. Yeah. At the time of decoupling. Yeah. 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 So, so if there was an excess, this would tell us that we've got you know some other species there. Okay. There are some there, there are some sigma eight tensions where Planck is measuring a high value, so I'll just say Planck high, and again low redshift probe, so let's call them low z, are measuring something low, and again in like this case the tensions like this one is three sigma, this is two to three sigma, so this is like two to three. I would say two sigma, okay? This one could be resolved either, some have suggested that just dialing up the neutrino mass to be non-minimal could solve it. Um, although others, just like others have said, an effective doesn't solve this problem, even Planck says it doesn't look like the degeneracy directions go in the right direction for this to solve this problem. The real issue with this, and actually there are a number of low Z probes that are saying sigma 8 is low, but why everybody wants to like, you know, look at all the systematics more carefully is that's the thing that would actually say GR is wrong on the largest scales. Any disagreement, these probes are probing structure growth directly structure growth. This is probing the expansion rate. And they need to give you the same cosmological parameters if general relativity is correct. If you measure some expansion rate probes like CMB and BAO, and you measure structure growth probes like optical weak lensing, so that's what the goal of LSST is, or any sort of other cluster probe, and you see a disagreement in parameters that you actually believe, that's telling you the underpinning of GR has a problem. Yeah. Um, they're separate tensions. This is, I mean, they're, they're sep. Uh, Uh, sigma 8 is just telling us our local expansion. So H is telling us our local expansion, and this is just telling us the amplitude of the matter power spectrum. So 
Sig. Um, most of the time, these low redshift probes are probing. They're largely sensitive to a combination of omega matter and sigmate, and that's where the degeneracy direction is. It's it's not uh, a degeneracy direction with H naught and sigmate. But let's talk more offline about that. Okay. And then the last one, which you've probably all heard about, is this, I'll just write it here: is this R issue, right? Where Bicep had said R is 0.2, and then Planck, even from their TT, because, it, well, let's, let me say, there is, there is some signal in the TT if you have non-zero R, and they said R is less than 0.11, three at 95% confidence level, okay? And then the, that tension went away um, with the honest story is that BICEP did not correctly use the Planck dust models that were available at the time. So, oh, this is videoed. So, um, <laughs> So if they, so other people have reanalyzed even using those same dust models and would have not said R is 0.2. Okay. And then in my one minute to impress you that the CMB field has so much more to offer, um, because I think that even astronomers have this funny view that Planck just did everything. But... The main science that we're after now in the next decade, so I would say CMB at least has an, a decade more, and since this is anticipating the next discoveries, then the main things are going to be pinning down and effective, measuring the neutrino mass, and detecting R. And there are a number of experiments called um, so I work on ACT. We have an upgrade called Advanced ACT. And at the same time, there's one called SPT3G. These are now, running now, right now, observing right now. And then this one is called the Simons Observatory. And then the other one is CMB Stage 4. Both are in planning stages now. And these are about five years out. And the science goals of CMB stage four, so if I write, um, so let me put errors on these for CMB stage four, so sigma error for CMB S4, will be to achieve an error on an effective of 0.02, uh, constraint on the neutrino mass with an error of 16 MeV, and R of 0 0.001, two orders of magnitude better than BICEP. And this would, of course, OK, so this one, if we don't see any deviation from the standard model number with this, then this would say no additional massless relativistic species. Massless relativistic species exist. The, for this one, we know the minimum mass is 60 MeV. So this, in the minimal mass scenario, and nature could be kinder to us, but if the mass really sits down at 60 MeV, this would give us a 3 to 4 sigma detection. I say at least three to four sigma detection. And people, particle physics physicists or experimentalists will always or often give you some hand wavy, oh, but this involves assumptions. But you should ask them what they mean by assumptions. Do they mean, oh, they, you know, they would quibble with this measurement and not believe it because they don't believe GR? The fundamental assumption is GR, right? So what other assumption are they saying? Are they saying the main degeneracy with this 
is not an effective, the, it's not curvature, the main degeneracy with neutrino mass is W being minus one. If you free up W minus one, then you, then you mess up your constraint, then you have much larger error bars than on the sum of the neutrino mass. So are they saying, well, they believe dark energy is not a vacuum energy? So you must ask them when people say, oh, you cannot believe cosmological neutrino mass because of assumptions. And then I heard a great, um, great counter a week ago, ask them what their assumptions are. Ask them what their chemistry assumptions are with Dune and all these experiments. Right? Well, I don't even think Dune can measure the absolute mass scale. But anyway. Sorry, okay. Why is that of this neutrino mass, of the sum of the neutrino masses. Right? So if the sum of the neutrino masses is 60 eV, that's, and we're measuring with an error of this, but it doesn't have to be 60 MeV, it could be 100 MeV, it could be more than that, right? Huh? This is CMB stage four goal. Oh, goal. Yeah, in five years. And this one, um, well, I don't need to tell you why this is important, but this would tell you the energy scale of inflation. Does anybody know, can Dune measure the absolute scale of the neutrino masses? I hear like conflicting things. Nobody knows here? No, no you know. think so? Yeah. yeah. I was wondering if we don't see the effect of the double neutrino by this mass, can it be conflict with that? Uh, yeah, because the atmospheric constraints are, <coughs> are telling us that this has to be greater than 60 eV. Yeah. And right now our CMB constraints if you believe CMB and BAO are saying that this has to be less than 200 EV. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, M, M, M. Yeah, so we're like coming in like this. Okay. Um, okay, and this would tell you the energy scale of inflation and um, also provide evidence for quantized gravity if we detected it. And probes energy scales 10 to the 12 orders of magnitude larger than the center of mass energy of the LHC. 10 to the 12 orders higher than LHC. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Done. I'm done. Ah, interesting question. Um, and we might have to go to the cocky break. But so you're two orders of magnitude below the Planck scale. So it has to do with these CMB, these fluctuations early in inflation are quantum fluctuations, right? And how they get tied to the dark matter fluctuations we see today is sort of what I mean by providing evidence for quantized gravity. But I, I, have, a, I have a better explanation on a slide, so you can talk to me. Right. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Most likely something that's not yet ruled out by our experiments. So. So I'm not sure the answer now because, as I said, the other paper said it didn't actually solve it. So, so it may not actually resolve the issue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Say that again. What determines the sensitivity is the number of detectors, which tells you the noise of your instrument. So we need. We're talking about one microkelvin noise within our resolution element, right? So, I mean, that, that's super sensitive. And then what also determines this is how low in L you can measure. So in that power spectrum, if I'm on the ground, I have trouble measuring the L equals 2 mode because that means I have to see the entire sky. 
the, the way that the tensor perturbations look, they're actually larger. There's actually a bump at L of 100, and then they peter out. So as low in L if I, I can go, if I can get to 100, if I can get to 50, I can measure that better. Yes? Okay. Yeah. No, um, no, and so actually my undergrad and grad student were, are just literally working on this last week. Um, so there is a theoretical uncertainty on this of about, so let's see. I should say one more thing, which I didn't say. This, this 16 MeV is adding BAO. Um, Without adding BAO, the error would have been about 70 MeV. And there I would have said there's about a 10 to 15% theoretical uncertainty on that. Just in forecasting, we use this sort of s silly Fisher tools to forecast. And just because of the way you calculate the derivatives, the neutrino mass derivative is just not very well behaved. And so there's like a, maybe a 10% uncertainty on that, just from forecasting errors, right? But um, but but are you saying when you actually get the data, is there a theoretical uncertainty? Uh, no, I would say no. Like I, I would just say it's a forecasting uncertainty. That's what I would say. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, that's it. Okay. Great.